Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to another episode of the Striker Texas podcast. My name is Edson Ochoa. I am the uh, beat reporter f- uh, for RGVFC. Uh, accompanying me today is uh, Jonathan Check and uh, Joe Rodriguez. Let's go over first uh, to the Borderlands and say hi uh, to Joe because... He hasn't been with us for the last, what, two two recordings? And I hear that Eighth Notch has been missing him a lot. That's what I've that's what I've been told via via DMs that they're like, Where's Joe, man? We really, really miss him. So Joe, say hi to say hi to all your fans. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Um, I don't know if you guys are being serious or if you're being facetious, to be perfectly honest with you. But uh, no, uh, regardless of what people may or may not be saying, um, it's a pleasure to be back again after a couple of weeks of being away from the podcast um, and ready to discuss uh, everything that's going on here uh, in the last, uh, you know, the last few matches of the regular season in the USL for all of our Texas teams. No, but to be to be honest, like we really, really missed you. Uh, uh, I missed you. Jonathan missed you. Uh, Robert, Roberto missed you. Even though you know, it's weird that when Roberto isn't here, you're here, and when you haven't been here, Roberto's here. So I don't know if you did something to Roberto or or, or what's going on. I'm not. Tr- I'm not trying to uh, insinuate anything. It's just soy periodista, diría Ernesto Chavana. Uh, but nah, but glad you glad you're back, Joe. Uh, Jonathan, how have you been? Well, see, I uh, I mean, I thought we were trying to get rid of Joe. What happened to that? No, I'm just kidding. Um, Except, it's... Well, you're, you're like, did I say that out loud? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Always, always happy to make a joke at y'all's expense. You're gonna have to get in a long line for that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I was gonna say though, on a positive note with Joe, I feel like we always go to me first, so it's it's nice that we started with Joe instead. Uh, we're we're mixing it up. Um, we saved the not quite best for last. Um, I'm Ouch. I'm doing all right. <laughs> I'm I'm saying I'm the not quite best so uh i can i, I love I some de- self-deprecation um Same. anyway yeah no I'm, I'm doing all right uh getting ready to go on what will be my last away trip of the year and san antonio fc's last away trip of the year um leaving tomorrow to head to birmingham so so now that we've got uh that we've got you uh pretty much speaking by the way you guys like my ha- uh, halloween theme with the lights <laughs> it's it, it, it's spo- it's spooktober, so uh, let, let's get into it. Um, so if you guys have any any spooky jokes, uh, the more the merrier. Uh, anyway, uh, but um, Jonathan, you guys played um, you guys played this this past weekend. Um, what can you tell us uh, about that game? Yeah, um, another one 0 win for SAFC. That was I think the fifth out of the last six matches for them, or fourth out of the last five. Uh, I, I think that's what it is. Four out of the last five, they've won one nil. And this was one of the sort of traditional kind of smash and grabs, if you will. Um, SAFC, not necessarily the best team for the first sort of 75 minutes of the match. And then somehow just flips a squit, uh, switch in the last 15 minutes, was really the aggressor. Got the goal when Pittsburgh uh, wasn't able to get it for the first 75 minutes, and SAFC escapes with a one 0 win. Uh, and Alan Marcina even said after the match, you know, look, we understand this wasn't our best performance, but we got the result, and that's what matters. Um, and then the the result, uh, it's worth noting. You know, I, I mentioned this next match will be SAFC's last away from home, and that's because with the win at Pittsburgh and Memphis uh, losing. SAFC has officially clinched the number one overall seed in the uh, in the playoffs. There, there will as long as SAFC keeps winning, it keeps playing at Tiro to field. So obviously, you know you've got to win those games, but um, it's in good position. It's it's in their hands now. Um, something interesting though, when I went to practice earlier today, I spoke with Fabian Garcia, and he called sort of a, you know achieving that, making that accomplishment, being first overall. He called that the beginning. <laughs> that was really interesting because, and as he rightly says, you know, if we don't then go on to win the playoffs, win the championship, what's the point? You know, and this is something that I think SAFC's fans and everyone has to look at over the next few weeks. It's like, okay, you know, you're you're chasing maybe even some USL records. You've won the overall regular season title. But if you don't do in the playoffs, you know, that's kind of just a consolation prize that no one is really going to remember, is really going to care about. 
So uh, it's it's going to be interesting to see how a save C now parlays this into the playoffs and uh, you know is able to hopefully not completely fall apart or get a bunch of injuries or anything over these last few weeks of the season. You know, real quick, Doug, just stating what you were saying, Jonathan, and we kind of joked about it on our thread, on our podcast thread. Um, you know, it, it's a shame that there's not much more made of, of that kind of accomplishment of being the, the league's best team over the course of the regular season. Um, I could understand it if it was kind of not really acknowledged if, if the playoff structure was significantly different in the USL championship. And by that, I mean, obviously, um, possibly a, a home and home series, not just a one-off, um, you know, to, to, to acknowledge it because, you know, uh, the, the playoff format is, is, is brutal. And it's, and I think to a certain extent, it's, it's not fair. Um, and I'll die on that hill, continue to say that until there's changes made to the playoff structure. Um, so yeah, that's why. And, and, you know, for players to say that, you know, well, it's not what we did over the course of the season doesn't, isn't really worth much. Well, you know, it kind of is. And it's just sad that you have to, and I understand where Fabian is coming from and the mindset that he's getting, you know, but it's just, it's one of those things where I think it, it just more needs to be made of, of what that body of work is over the regular season. Cause it's a very long and it's a very hard regular season. One other thing that kind of caught, caught my attention, Jonathan, about this game against the river hounds is that Pittsburgh dominated possession. They really didn't have a lot of shots uh, they only had five compared to eleven from uh, from San Antonio. But another thing that caught my eye was was the fact that San Antonio's pass accuracy was below fifty percent, and it's a defender that ended up scoring the goal. Considering how close we are to uh, to the uh, the playoffs to occur, does this is this worrisome for the fan base or for Alan Alan Morcina in general? the the struggle that the attackers are are seem to have in front of goal like i said marcina did acknowledge that that wasn't their best performance uh, but at the same time and i i even the the way you segue into that it it's almost like you you read the article that uh will probably be going up tomorrow actually um where i write about how you know safc is sort of dealing with i, I don't know if pittsburgh said anything but some other opponents you know, over the last year or so have said, uh, you know, they're really, they, they don't like SAFC's style. Um, Brendan Burke, the Switchbacks head coach a couple of weeks ago, even said they're, quote, not a, or not a very good soccer team. Um, and yet SAFC is getting results. And that's what you need to be doing at this part of the season. Um, as far as the forwards actually scoring goals, it's been something that I've brought up all year, you know, uh, whether it's, yeah, whether it's, you know, uh, all the players that have rotated in, basically. Um, is there any consistent goal score? Sam Adenarin is basically the only one that, that I can think of that, you know, in a pinch, I think you can look at him and say, you're going to get the goal. You're our guy. We can rely on you. I don't know if there's really anyone else that does that. But at the same time, if SAFC is able to stifle teams to, lock them out defensively it just needs that one goal and so it's not pretty to keep winning matches 1-0 i'm sure uh, as i wrote in this article that i allude to as they've seen fans will probably want some insurance goals but at the moment they're getting the job done even if it's not the prettiest yeah and mm-hmm. they're getting that goal on the other end one way or another so I think by the time uh, the the fans are listening to this podcast, that that uh, article uh, will already be published on thestriker.com. So be sure to check that out after you finish listening to the Striker Tangos podcast, obviously. But moving on to, to the next game, because we've got three more games to talk about. Uh, so RGVFC uh, did host uh, the number one seed in the Eastern Conference, Louisville City. Uh, RGVFC fall uh, at home, kind of ends their, their four-game uh, unbeaten streak. Um, with a 1-0 loss at HEB Park. Um, they were kind of caught off guard by Louisville City's high pressure. And I know I've mentioned it before in previous episodes of the Striker Texas, on my podcast as well. RGV, whenever an opposing team employs high pressure against them, they struggle a lot. Louisville City was able to isolate Jonas Fieldberg and Christian Pinzon. You saw the desperation from Christian Pinzon with the fact that 
him and Jonas Fieldberg switched sides because uh, Pinzon could not handle the marking by Manny Perez. And, you know, there was at times where Christian Pinzon would receive the ball with his back towards the goal, and he already had two players, like, right on him, like, right on his back, not allowing him to turn around. You know, Christian Pinzon thrives on space. The last couple of opponents granted him that space that he could work with freely. Louisville City did not, and, and in the first half, that's that's what uh, that's what held RGVFC to not having a lot of opportunities on goal. The high pressure also forced uh, RGVFC to create some mistakes in the first couple of minutes. There were there were you know Louisville City had a crossbar, a ball hit the crossbar. That's a multiple opportunities you saw. You know I was at the uh, field level close to close to the pitch, and you could hear. Players like Gringo Torres and Wahabakwe getting mad and getting frustrated with each other, you know, kind of telling like, why, why the hell are you not marking this guy or this guy or anything like that? Uh, it, it was everything was falling in shambles for the, for for RGBC in the first half. Um, second half, they make some adjustments. Uh, Tyler Derrick mentions that you know Wilmer Cabrera kind of lit a fire under them in the second half. Uh, Louisville City kind of led back on that uh, on that uh, high pressure. Toros began to dominate possession, began to have a lot more opportunities on goal, but Kyle Morden has just been on fire as a goalkeeper for for Louisville City and uh, was able to keep uh, the clean sheet uh, at HEB Park. They had one opportunity right in the 95th minute where uh, a shot by Akima Connor Ward was uh, deflected and, uh, you know, heading towards goal. And Kyle Morden, who had already thrown himself, managed to react with his feet and be able to keep it off of the way of, of goal. But one thing that kind of struck me, uh, and I wanted to get your y'all's thoughts on this, and this is something that Eric Pimentel said at the end of the match, because I asked him how the locker room was taking this result. And he said, and this is translated from Spanish, he said, the team is taking the loss at a certain point well because we're realizing that we still need to improve. We need to play like we did in the second half, not relaxing, continuing the level of performances that we were executing. Sometimes it's good to get tripped up before the playoffs begin to focus on the fact that we have three more games left to clinch playoffs and enter the playoffs with good momentum, which is the most important. Sounds legit. I mean, he's, I, <laughs> I'm sorry, Jonathan. Um, no, yeah, sounds legit. I mean... He's absolutely right. I mean, you can still learn things, especially, you know, it. I, I think having any kind of adversity or, or things not go your way at this point of the season, it's good for you because it just forces you to maintain that pinpoint sharp focus. And I think particularly for the Toros, uh, they've had a really strong, you know, end to their season. And so I think, you know, one loss here or there that they – are able to sort of take some lessons from and it, it's not like they lost to you know just any old team they lost to louisville city who is you know was compete and I, I think still is at the top of the east at the moment yes. um is in the driver's seat to win that conference is a perennial contender not just for the top of the conference but for the championship has made it to the semifinals their first like six or seven seasons so you you didn't lose to just any old team and so uh, i think it makes total sense, you know, to occasionally, you know, okay, you lose some momentum, you don't get any points from this match, but uh, you were able to test yourself against a team that is, you know, if, if things go well for RGV, if it's able to bounce back, uh, you know, who knows, could be facing them in the final if RGV goes on a really crazy run. Uh, but even then, it's just a good team, and that's what RGV is going to have to face a few times to get there. And it's what the player said, uh, the Christian Pinzon said, uh, during the week you know he and i talked about it last last episode you know they said this is a good benchmark for us like we're not shying away from it because this pretty much gives us a parameter of where we're at when we face off the against the best teams in the usl championship now they realize that you know we're still far away from uh, from the elite level in the usl championship we're not that far off but there's still some details that the team needs to kind of improve if they want to defeat the best of the best in in the usl championship and potentially you know if the time if the cards are played right you know uh contest a a, a usl championship final against some of these teams from the Eastern Conference. So uh, overall, yeah, the result wasn't favorable when it came to, like, for example, this playoff push. 
Uh, but I think it was it, it, it was a a result that really wasn't outside of the uh, of the realm of what could happen playing against uh, a team of the, of the of this caliber. So overall, I think uh, the fans sh- should be uh, not as frustrated uh, on on this result. And, and then moving on, Orange VFC also had a midweek match yesterday against the second team, the second best team in the Eastern Conference, which is Memphis Nine Hundred One. At AutoZone Park, which is a baseball field. And then you also add that Wilmer Cabrera decides to put in an alternative squad with only three uh, regular starters in this lineup. Everybody else are second or third stringers, which caught everybody by surprise, including myself, especially with the fact that he'd always mentioned you know, we have to give 100%. We cannot, you know, uh, we cannot make any mistakes uh, in this push for, for the playoffs. And it seemed like everything was going wrong for the Toros. You know, uh, Memphis gets the go-ahead goal in the second minute. Uh, Daniel Luis Sa- uh, Saez gets, uh, gets injured in, uh, in the 20-some minute of the, uh, of the first half, bringing Juan David Cabezas. Um, but surprisingly, from the middle of the first half on, RGB looked like the better side, despite there being an alternative lineup with players that probably haven't played alongside each other for a long time in a in an actual game uh, game environment. So I know we were looking at it right now, and it was I think they they outshot in in that in in that um, in the first half. I think they were they outshot Memphis eight to five. Este. Isidro Martinez had three clear opportunities like in the last five, ten minutes of the first half that kind of went uh, off target. Second half, um, Memphis gets another goal, uh, but this time this uh, this was caused by a, a clear lack of chemistry between uh, Juan David Cabezas and uh, who was playing as a center back instead of uh, the usual center defensive midfielder uh, and Wahabakwe. Um uh, uh, but then after that, like right after that, Wilmer decides to bring in Fieldberg, uh, Jonathan Ricketts, and Christian Pinson. Their impact was felt immediately, uh, and uh, RGVFC get uh, get two uh, favorable deflections that go into the back of the net, uh, get the equalizer, and they were really, really close in the last couple of minutes to get a the comeback goal that would have been a 3-2 favorable win for RGVFC. In the second half, they... Also outshot Memphis uh, 901 uh, by eight to three, and only one shot was made by Memphis after their goal uh, that was early in the second half. So overall, a good performance is just left a question in the back of many many fans uh, of what could have happened had Wilmer Cabrera used their uh, regular starting eleven for all uh, ninety plus or, or since the beginning uh, of the match. So, so that was so that's what happened with RGVFC, uh, and so so now we move on to the next match that happened yesterday, and that was El Paso Locomotive facing off against uh, Colorado Springs Switchbacks. Joe, I know you have a lot to talk about this, so the floor is yours. No. Um, <laughs> The Achilles heel for El Paso Locomotive FC under uh, John Hutchinson returns. Uh, the fact that they cannot defend under transition, counterattack, uh, was a difference in this game. A first half match, um, first half match for the El Paso Locomotive that um, they started off doing relatively good. They did fall uh, behind in the score. 22nd minute, but six minutes later, they got the equalizer off of a uh, Lucha Solid knack. Uh, the opening goal was by Michi Nagala, N- Nagalina, excuse me, uh, for the Colorado Switchbacks. Um, and El Paso was looking like the better team for the opening 45 minutes, uh, dominating pretty much basically in all parameters as far as uh, the match went for the opening 45 minutes. Early in the second half, uh, El Paso quickly generated two threats on goal. Um, and from there, it just fell apart, and it fell apart in the span of 15 minutes for El Paso Locomotive. Uh, now, Lina scored two more goals, one off of a penalty kick, um, and 
it was four to one. And I'll simply put the third, the three, actually, with the exception of the penalty kick, um, you know, Brendan Burke, Jonathan, you alluded to the fact about how San Antonio plays. You know, I, I think I've mentioned it before on this podcast. Never point any fingers because you have three pointing right back at you. Um, and, you know, Colorado, I mean, if, 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 if San Antonio style is being concrete, disciplined, um, well-positioned, knowing what it is that they have to do and, and knowing how to fend off whatever it may be that the opposition can throw at them, you know, that's a whole lot more of a respectable way of playing because you know what you're playing, you know, that, that's a, a whole lot more respectable way of playing than what Colorado shows, which basically they show to wait for the error of your opponent and try and capitalize off of a, off of a, a counterattack, because that's the only thing that they have in their repertoire. Um, and un- unfortunately, a team like Colorado that plays like that, that's a perfect res- recipe to exploit the locomotive. And boy, did they exploit them. Um, you know, you know, El Paso just cannot get out of their own way. They do not know how to slow down transition, how to prevent counterattacks. It's something that, that's been their problem year in or game in and game out over the course of the season. And and when they get exposed in that way, it gets ugly and it gets ugly in a hurry. And, uh, you know, un, you know, uh, that, that was basically just the case after the game. Solanek spoke with the media. Eric Calvillo spoke with the media. They said the exact same thing, both of them. Uh, they said that, you know, they were aware that everyone on that team was responsible for the loss yesterday. In the second half, it was a completely different team that just came out flat and just not up for the challenge. It was two different teams that you saw. Uh, they could not... Ag- they could not give a reason as to why that was the case, but you know it was pretty easy to see that that was you know that that was the case for for the closing forty five minutes. This team came out flat. They came out imprecise, and that's all a team like Colorado Spring needs to 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 score goals and to and to you know widen the gap as far as what the scoreboard says. Um, uh, John Hutchinson um, also was 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 plenty upset. He obviously acknowledge the fact that this team can't perform or still has not figured out how to how to avoid the, uh, the counterattack goals and how to avoid being exploited on the transition. And I asked him, the one thing I asked him, I go, well, I mean, you know who your opponent is. You're telling me that that's how they play and that they ripped you to, you know, that they ripped you to shreds. Did you at all consider maybe putting – a five changing something up tactically show, give them a different look. And he said, no, you know, and I mean, I think that's just the MO. That's just the MO of, of your tip. You know, that's just your MO of many, many coaches, especially in the world of soccer that we play this way. I can, I can say that I, you know, I know a lot about soccer. I mean, I'm not talking about Hutchinson here. I'm just talking about a lot of coaches they, they, they talk, they say they know a lot about soccer, but when it comes to burying things up, no, I'm stubborn. I'm going to stick to my, my beliefs and my principles. You yeah. know what's, you know, what's funny is that Wilmer Cabrera has been more vocal about this is how we play. This is, we're not going to change because of, uh, uh for, the of record, for, for the record, Mr. Cabrera, I'm not saying anything this episode. It's all your, no, 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 what, no, 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 what, what, <laughs> what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that even Wilmer, who has been more vocal about his stubbornness, about playing the way he feels RGV should play, regardless of who's their opponent, even him decided to change his tactic when facing off against Colorado Springs switchbacks, knowing what their strengths and weaknesses are. And that worked out well for them. So which is surprise, which surprises me that John Hutchinson, who hasn't been very vocal, or at least you haven't said much about him being, uh, uh, or saying that he's stubborn, admitting he's stubborn in press conference, decided oh, no. to, decided to go with that. He hasn't admitted that he's stubborn in conference. I mean, to, in, in all fairness and full disclosure, I'm saying it right here. John Hutchinson just simply said, no, I didn't consider it. You know, I, I just didn't consider it. This is the mm-hmm. way we play, and we think that this is the way it is. But I'm just saying, you know, I'm. this is what I'm saying. I'm thinking to myself, 
well, man, you know, maybe a line of five, maybe play with an old school sweeper. I mean, something <laughs> double, double yeah. mark somebody, double mark somebody. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm just saying, you know, it just it seems you're 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 getting your lunch eaten time in time out against the same opponent in the same manner and you don't switch anything up. I'm sorry, you're opening yourself up to to that very question. And, and, and I asked it last night, and that was the answer that he gave. It makes me think of the this is fine meme where the dog's just <laughs> sitting at a table with everything on fire around him. This is fine. Like, okay, sure. Whatever you say, John. <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, at the end of the day, but, but you know, at, at the end of the day, I, you know, you brought up Brendan Brooks' comment with regards to San Antonio. But, you know, they're the exact same way. I mean, in a lot of ways, it's a lot less respectful what they do. They wait to capitalize on the mistake of others. That's not – that's, you know, I, I you know, I, I don't see very much honor in playing that way. But like you said, this isn't about honor. This is about getting results. It's about getting results. And, and if it gets the job done, well, then so, so be it. But uh, let's give some. Let's give uh, Joe a couple of minutes to kind of cool down, uh, because I know he just got flared up from talking about this game. Uh, because we need to look forward and, and see the upcoming games for uh, for the Texas USL teams. Obviously, you know we're at the final push of the season. Uh, El Paso Locomotive is still trying to to. Uh, grasp a playoff uh, spot. RGVFC is also trying to grasp it. Obviously, San Antonio, they've already uh, they've already clinched it a long time ago, so uh, they're pretty much uh, uh, in the hammock uh, drinking some coconuts like, like the picture they posted last time, if you guys recall. Um, so, but RGVFC will be hosting Phoenix Rising at HB Park this Saturday. Um, it's going to be very important for uh, RGVFC because this is a, a, a team that is also pushing for a playoff spot. And if RGVFC gets the win against Phoenix, they eliminate Phoenix Rising from contention. Um, and so, but Phoenix Rising is coming into this game with uh, with a two game uh, winning streak. So they're starting to get momentum. They they're starting, I'm guessing, to understand what their new coach expects from them with his tactics, with his play style. So uh, it's not going to be an easy feat for RGVFC. We know about the, you know, the speed of Babu Karjai. Uh, we know, we know uh, about uh, the, their players, um, that the potential that they have. They did defeat RGVFC when they played at Wild Horse Pass a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so uh, it, it is going to be, uh, very uh, difficult for RGVC, but it is plenty, plenty uh, doable for the Toros to try to get a positive uh, result uh, against uh, Phoenix Rising. So, uh, and I know that um, a lot of teams like Monterey Bay are going to be looking closely about what happens uh, in, in that match. The key would be, can Jonathan Ricketts be able to kind of adapt to the the speed of Babakar Jai, limit the amount of space to give him, and so to try to limit him and what he can do? I mean, the Toros have had Babakar Jai last last season, so Wilmer Cabrera knows what he, um, pretty much what his strengths and weaknesses are. Can he can he exploit those weaknesses to limit uh, Phoenix, Phoenix Rising? Can Christian Pinzon and Jonas Fieldberg continue their their positive impact uh, in the offense and, and be able to to score uh, goals uh, against a really not that great uh, Phoenix Rising defense as well. In the last game, um, there was a lot of mistakes, you know, coming off of uh, uh, of their own uh, half in transition with the high pressure. Can they continue to exploit in Christian Pinzon or Jonas Fielberg get those opportunities to put those in the back of the net? So it's going to be a very interesting match uh, to watch uh, this Saturday, which will be at uh, 7.30 uh, p.m. Um, and so uh, I don't know what you guys, if you guys have any thoughts uh, uh, of, the, of this game. Well, no, I mean, for me, it's just real simple. I mean, obviously, it's a must-win situation for, for RGV. So as far as, you know, the aggressiveness, I would hope to think that RGV just comes out, you know, guns a-blazing um since the opening whistle because i think also on the flip side I, I i think regardless of what regardless 
if the Toros get the win, I think it's also safe to say that they have one and a half feet in the playoffs just because they have tiebreakers over. Yeah, Oakland and, o- Oakland and El Paso. A- exactly. So I think all of the motivation is going to be there. Um, as far as Phoenix goes, I mean, you you talk about how the, they're, they're gaining momentum, they're gaining traction. You know, it'll be interesting to see how, how, how far they come in motivated. And then, of course, not to sound like a broken record, but I mean, that is it's a factual thing. Uh, with the exception of San Antonio, I would think everyone else struggles going into the Valley. So yeah. there's always that aspect of it. It's just a very tough place to play. Jonathan smirking because he knows that that's not true for San Antonio. <laughs> but, but you know, other than that, well, well, might... well, no, but... sorry, that might not be the case uh, for San, or that might also be the case for San Antonio. But San Antonio doesn't have to deal with the logistics and the acclimation that is RGV, which are two very enormous. That hurdles. that that is that is very true. But uh, Joe, so you've got two games coming up uh, until we we reconvene for the next episode of the podcast. You've got this Saturday. You guys are playing Orange County SC, who is already eliminated from playoff contention, and then uh-huh. you face off a, a, a very difficult opponent, which was the rescheduled match against the Tampa Bay Rowdies. Yeah, no, definitely uh, facing an opponent that's obviously going to come into the borderland playing for pride. Um, and trust me, uh, I'm sure a team like OCSC is, you know, I'm sure it's crossed through their mind. Um, you know, if we beat El Paso, that we eliminate them from playoff contention. That'd be also kind of nice. You know, uh, you know that I think playing the role of a spoiler for a soccer team that is at the bottom of the table the way OCSC is, is their turmoil. They want to get wins. They want to. They want to. They want to cause havoc or get some attention any way, shape, or form in a positive way. And that would be a big positive way. Um, but just real quick, going in to Saturday night's game, this is the biggest part, guys. <sighs> Yesterday when I was leaving Southwest University Park, and I haven't had a chance to look into it, even today when I was just prepping for my talking points for tonight's podcast, somebody very close to the team just reminded me that about – Five players are probably, by by this person's count, just briefly reviewing this stuff, five players for El Paso Locomotive are not going to be eligible because of yellow cards. Ouch. On Saturday. Wow. I haven't looked into it, the disciplinary report or anything, but yet I someone very close to me and off the air, I'm not, or I'm not, you know, Someone close to me told me this. I haven't looked into it, but I will tomorrow when I when I write my, my preview for the for, for the match. Uh, but that could be huge, and that could be an enormous hurdle for the locomotive. Huge. Um, so it's going to be very easy. And, and 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 now going back as I was driving home yesterday from the from the from Southwest University Park, I was thinking John Hutchinson is probably obviously aware of this. Because he did say something in passing in his comments is, you know, today we're going to, rec- or tomorrow, meaning today they're, they were going to recover. To, on Friday, they're going to do a full practice. And he told me, or he said, whoever looks the best, it, that's going to be a part of the starting 11. So maybe he was being a little bit cryptic there as far as I'm going to have to look elsewhere to see how the heck I formulate a starting 11 for Saturday. So if you want to talk about an additional barrier or an additional challenge to overcome Saturday night, look no further than the players that he may not have available for Saturday due to accumulation of yellow cards. So having said that, then you also have to go to to Florida to face off against the Tampa Bay Rowdies. Yeah, no, definitely. It doesn't get any easier Um, right there. Honestly, the only... One of the biggest things that, granted, if El Paso wins on Saturday, the biggest thing that I think El Paso has to hope for is that Tampa Bay um, packs it in for the year and goes takes their foot off the pedal in the biggest way in order to prepare for the playoffs. That would be the safest thing. And the fact that the game was moved technically two weeks later, further down, is something that Tampa Bay, I'm sure, did not account for. 
So they're they're the way they're looking at this game, I can only assume has changed significantly. And I would hope that they would play they would do an LA uh, 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 an LA Galaxy 2 just play all of the reserves or or whatever those those MLS associated teams in the USL do where they just put in a bunch of experimental players and give them some experience. Yeah, definitely not going to be very easy uh, uh, path for Apostle Locomotive as they try to salvage a, a playoff spot away from Oakland and RGV and other teams that are that are below them. Um, so, but at least the positive for Apostle Locomotive is like now, like it pretty much goes down to the wire uh, to see if, if they if they make it or not because they managed to kind of level the the games played with the rest of the uh, of the western conference but uh moving on because on uh on sunday san antonio fc will be taking on birmingham legion in birmingham what are your thoughts on that jonathan yeah so uh i i think before we started sort of previewing our games you were saying you know there's not much at stake for san antonio fc or something along those lines uh they are still you know they, they don't want to completely lose momentum in these last couple matches and they're still chasing a couple usl records if safc wins out it has the most points in a regular season ever but it can only do that with two wins um and i believe also if it wins this sunday it will tie the record for most away wins in a season so uh you know if safc can write themselves into the history books and keep its momentum going as well uh you know that's a feather in their cap um but ellen marcina did say you know they're not going to risk any players that might be a little fragile at the moment uh yeah. and obviously you know you you want to make sure that what you're you, you don't want to say you're prioritizing the playoffs yet um but in the back of his mind it might be you know let's let's make sure that when push comes to shove when the time is right everyone's going to be ready to give it their all uh on october 28th when we have our first playoff match um so it's going to be interesting to see kind of what the lineup is if marcina does you know put some squad players in there at least to start maybe uh didn't work out too hot for rgv but you know safc is not simply rgv um and uh, Facing Birmingham, you know, it's it's going to be an interesting one. They are one of the better teams in the East. Uh, and I, I would highlight, you know, they've scored about as many goals as SAFC. They're not quite as good defensively, but they're still solid. And I would look in particular at someone like Matt Van Okel, who, uh, you know, that's a name that San Antonio fans, if you've been a fan of San Antonio soccer for a while, uh, you remember him from the old NASL days when it was still the Scorpions. So he is a veteran goalkeeper. I'm sure he knows how to marshal that defense really well. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see you know, what SAFC is able to do on that end, especially because also uh, I was looking at the stats before we got on. Birmingham has, I think, the second most shots in the league. So SAFC is going to be up against it probably. Um, but if it's able to hold strong, you know, get another clean sheet, I think it would be like the sixth in the last seven matches. Um, and if his, if SAFC is able to get that goal, like it somehow always seems to do, well, there you go. There's another win. And you're looking at, you know, coming back home for the last game of the regular season against Orange County at home. Uh, it, it looks pretty, pretty comfortable. And you would bet on SAFC getting that last win and setting a record. But you, you can't get ahead of yourself. First, you got to deal with Birmingham. That is very true. So now, having said all of these four four matches, let's give our predictions to see uh, how many points the, uh, the Texas USL teams will be accumulating by the time we reconvene ne uh, next week. So, uh, Jonathan, we'll go with you. Uh, who didn't have a chance to? I, I figured we were just going to skip predictions because it's already kind of a longer show. But uh, we'll just do it real quick. Off, off the top of my head, I'll just do seven. Okay. Nine. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with six. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with six. Uh, so uh, that's our that's our predictions for uh, the number of points. But guys, thank you so much for for tuning in for this another episode of, of uh, the Shaker Tejas podcast. And remember, guys, we can't do this without uh, without your support. So be sure to subscribe to the Striker. Uh, the same old price uh, as always with a lot more coverage around uh, the the United States, uh, both N uh, MLS and uh, NWSL and, of course, the USL uh, Championship. And uh, 
obviously, thank you so much for tuning in to the Striker Texas podcast. We'll see each other next week when we reconvene, and hopefully we can talk about the uh, probabilities or what the combinations are needed for some of these teams to hopefully make a, uh, a, a playoff ticket in the Western Conference. But have a good night. Be safe out there. And uh, let's let's go and enjoy the, the best sport in the world, which is soccer. <laughs>